The scripture reading for the New Gospel, New Testament reading for this morning is Luke 14, verses 25 to 35. Now large crowds were traveling with him, and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brother and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to wage war against another king will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000. If he cannot then, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give, all, give up all your possessions. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is fit neither for the soil nor the manure heap. They throw it away. Let anyone with ears to hear listen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So it's funny, Pastor Heather, I... I think I got this right. You have rally day next week, rally, rally day. Uh, what caught my attention about rally day, friends, is that you're going to get to have a meal, breakfast, I think I heard, in the middle during, yes. And that reminded me of my childhood. See, I grew up in a Baptist church, a New Bethel Missionary Baptist Church, and I love the Sundays when we were having a visiting church because that meant in between services, the, the visiting church would come in the afternoon, we would have a meal. Not only would we have a meal, it meant that I would get to partake in Miss Ann's pound cake. Now, I know none of you have ever had Miss Ann's pound cake, and I am sorry for that, but it is the best pound cake in the world. Now, this particular Sunday that I remembered, I was excited. I had heard that there was going to be a church coming, and I thought to myself, oh, I'm going to be first in line. And so those of us who have, who have grown up in our, our black churches, remember first you have the food at the beginning of the table, and at the very end we have the desserts. And for pound cake, it was already sliced up, laid out on those white foam little plates. So I didn't even go and get my meal. My mom was so mad at me. I went straight to the dessert and got a piece of pound cake. I sat down and took a healthy bite. But friends, to my dismay, it wasn't quite as good as I had remembered. It um, was okay, but it wasn't Miss Ann's. Okay. It didn't taste as good as I remembered. It didn't get all the warm and fuzzies that I had grown to love when I ate Miss Ann's pound cake. Friends, I believe this passage this morning, the author of Luke's way of telling me who is a lover of God after chapters of miracles and parables about discipleship and healing that you cannot have good pound cake all the time. Sometimes you need something different to fully understand, something palatable to understand. In this case, it's an analysis of discipleship. This message is for you and me, the Gentile. So allow Jesus to make you a little uncomfortable this morning. I have a question. Can you be a Christian without being a disciple? Can you be a Christian without being a disciple? 
In our scripture for this morning, Jesus is on his way to the Jerusalem. The, the crowds are amassing around him. Now, there is an expectation that he is going to be king and taking over an empire, but that is for another time. But this crowd is a mixed crowd of poor and wealthy people. And Christ has just performed miracles. Healed a man with dropsy, a crippled woman. And sprinkle in all those miracles and healings or messages of not burying your father after your father dies, but following Christ. We know the verse, let the dead bury the dead in Luke 9. Also sprinkled in there is the Good Samaritan. In there is the question of asking who is my neighbor whom I should love. Again, so many followers. And for you social media connoisseurs out there, Jesus is trending high. Millions, billions to say. Now, if I'm following Jesus, if I'm considered to be a disciple at this time, I'm thinking this is fantastic. The crowds are growing. Jesus, just keep it going. You're doing a great job. But no, Jesus isn't concerned about numbers, at least not in the way that we may think of. He's concerned for intentional numbers, the ones he means when, we, when he gave us this great commission. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of age. What does it mean to be a learner? a follower, an imitator of Jesus, a disciple. And Jesus is asking the question, do you understand? Do not enter into this lightly. Now I'm going to give you a little hint for the answer of the question I asked earlier. Can you be a Christian without being a disciple? Now, I might reference the fact that the word Christian is only used three times in the New Testament as a description for those who are Christ Christians, but disciple is used over 260 times. But that's too easy because I get it. I get why some of us live a yes to that question of Christian versus disciple, as if they are separate. See, friends, we use a lot of transactional language in our faith, to describe our faith. See if this strikes a bell with you. Sin is an eternal debt that we cannot pay. Christ sent to cancel our debt on the cross. Christ's resurrection, debt paid, death defeated. And the faith story continues. We receive you, Jesus Christ, into our lives as Savior so we can have forgiveness, never-ending life with God. Thank you for the gift of grace, we say for the gift of eternal life, the end, justification by faith alone. Now, I know it's not that simple, friends, but I think you get my point. This transactional gospel message we hear can lead to a complacency and a lived faith of our call to discipleship. Now, as I said earlier, Jesus has given many examples of the dangers of attachments, attachments that lead us away from our call in responding to discipleship. So they must not be getting it, friends. Jesus stops and turns and says these things to them, so they must not be getting it. Or at least Jesus wants to make sure everyone understands this thing called discipleship. So Jesus speaks specifically and vividly so that there's no question of understanding. Following me is not the path to worldly power or glory. It requires a loyalty which may, which may sacrifice the dearest things in life. And for suffering, much like someone on the cross. Do you understand this? Jesus asks. Have you taken the time to estimate the cost of the yes? And in true Presbyterian sermon form, 
Jesus gives us three points of reference so things are very clear. Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brother and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. One, surrender personal relationship. Two, surrender self. And three, jettison all personal baggage. Now, friends, I know Luke uses strong language here. He uses the word hate. Matthew, less so, would equate that to forbidding anything, loving anything more than Jesus Christ. Hate and love during this time, during Christ's time, refers less about emotion, more, but more about the behavior that either honored or dishonored. So number one, hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, which is surrendering personal relationship. Friends, back then, family meant everything. There was a high value to family. It was the center of all life. Every member was expected to protect the family and protect the honor of the family. So if you, I don't know, decided to follow someone who claimed to be the son of God and leaving all other things behind, not only would you bring disgrace to you, but to your family as well, especially if done in disobedience to the patriarch. There's that silly, you know, commandment about honoring father and mother. Today, friends, I think the message for us is no love in life can compare with the love we must bear to Jesus Christ. Friends, you don't know this, but my wife sits right in front of me here. My Khaleesi is what I call her. If you know, you know. If someone were to do something to hurt her or to harm her, hate is a close representation of the feeling that I would have. Disciples who love Christ must hate anything that hurts or goes against Christ's life in us. Caring for the marginalized, the homeless, fighting oppression, using that same passion and emotion and energy as if someone hurt our loved ones. And then Jesus takes it a step forward in requirement of discipleship. That that attachment should not get in the way of the called life of discipleship. I just got ordained last year. Saturday. This call on our lives hits home for me. The call to discipleship. It is above and beyond all. Number two, hate even life itself. Surrender self. Back then, friends, it literally meant giving up one's own life and following Jesus Christ. It could have happened to you. Today, what I'll say for us is when it comes to following Christ, your identity must change. I am a Christian disciple who happens to be a father, a mother, sister, or brother, pastor, therapist. If you are not willing to elevate Christ over your life, you cannot claim to be a disciple. That means willing to forgo your will and the things you want for your life to God and God's will and what God wants for your life, through Jesus Christ. Three, promise I'm almost done. Wherever do, whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Jettison all personal baggage. From the gospel of Erica Badu, bag lady, Bag lady, you're going to hurt your back, dragging all them bags like that. I guess nobody ever told you. All you must hold on to is you, is you, is you. One day, all them bags going to get in your way. One day, all them bags going to get in your way. I said one day, all them bags are going to get in your day, in your way. One day, all them bags are going to get in your way. So, pack light. Friends, we need to let go of our burdens 
and struggles. How many songs do we sing here in church about picking up our cross and picking up our burdens to carry our struggles and bury our burdens? That's a piece of what Christ meant for us today. Because think about it back then. If Christ was saying this message to those who were walking with him, it's not carrying your struggles. How can you carry your, your cross when you're carrying other stuff, bag lady? Friends, the only people carrying crosses during Christ's time were guilty people. Imagine the crowd hearing this stipulation for discipleship. It shook them to their core, I promise. What that means for our discipleship is humility. To first acknowledge our own guilt before we are pointing our fingers at others who we deem guilty. Imagine if the so-called Christian nationalists had this lens when confronting with history of this country. I'm gonna leave that right there. Let me sum it up. There is no room for half-hearted commitment to following Jesus Christ. So make sure you account for the call. Why though? Why is it so important that we understand this cost and accept it as Christians, the cost of discipleship? Friends, it is simple and extremely important. We are useful to God. We have a purpose. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? Friends, I love seasoning. Hot sauce, Old Bay, a few others. My wife gets mad at when I use them. Salt was useful in Jesus' time. It was useful for preservation against corruption of the world. That's our call as Christians to be the salt, to be the preservation against corruption in the world. Salt was used for flavoring. That is our call as Christians to be the flavoring in the world. One who always processes with hope, joy, cheerfulness, where good things flourish and evil shrivels. But that's only found in Jesus Christ. We are created for the use of God in this world, and God wants us to change this world. That only happens through our commitment. And the disciple asks, what does Jesus want me to do? How am I reflecting him right now and every day? How can I grow in relationship with Christ? Do I, number one, surrender personal relationships and step into the divine love of Jesus Christ? Number two, surrender self and let the will of God guide me. And number three, jettison all personal baggage, knowing that all things belong to God. Friends, we are disciples in this world, but not of it. By surrendering to the Lord and releasing our notions of what we want for our lives, understanding the difficulties ahead, you are not putting your hope in the present world. You are becoming free to enjoy your life as is, but with Christ as a companion. Now, if this sounds like a daunting task, like high demands of Christ, let me remind you, let me share with you the real good news of the gospel today. Dare I say the Miss Ann pound cake piece of this sermon. Because we know that we, through Scripture, are not alone. We are not left alone to fulfill this request. Christ has called us to the steep road we walk on. But Christ is with us every step of the way and will be there at the end to meet us and say, Well done, good and faithful servant. Amen. And amen.